Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we thank you, Lord, that you want to feed us this morning. The Lord, you don't want us to just have knowledge of facts. You want us to know you. Because in knowing you, we are settled. We become people who can trust you better. Because the Bible says, Lord, that those who know your name will place their trust in you. And the more we know about you, the more secure, we're, we're anchored, we're positioned. Our faith becomes um, that much more stable and, and not being tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Or our emotions will begin to dictate what's truth. And we start to understand things in the light of unchanging truths and plans that you forever settle in heaven. And because of that, we aren't shaken by watching the news or by what choices our kids are making. Or even if we're going through hormonal changes that make us kind of not think real well, or maybe our husbands are overreacting about something, or we're, we're facing crisis or tragedy. But Lord, it, it, you're the anchor. And these truths and knowing your plan and who you are really does cause us to be people who say, you know, my feet will not slip. And that by your favor, my mountain shall stand strong. And that, Lord, even if we cry, even if we're hurt, even if we're uh, disoriented, we don't have to feel lost. <laughs> and I thank you for that, because that's a scary feeling. And I thank you, Lord, that you will, you will make us, you'll make us lie down in green pastures. Just say, lay down right here, right here, right here. Quit running. Quit running back and forth and panicking. I can just sense that you're speaking that to people in this room this morning. That you don't want us to be running around. You want us to be still yes. and know that you're God. And for those women here that just have these waves of intense situations and they feel like as soon as they get their head out of one, another one comes, I pray, Lord, that they be reminded that you will be the lifter of their head and, and they're not going to drown. They're going to make it through. They might swallow some water, but they're not going to drown. And help them trust you for that. Help them to know that you're with them in deep waters. In Jesus' name, amen. If we can close the side door, that would be great. If we can close the back door, too, that would be great. Okay, if you open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. Anybody in here uh, Jewish by descent? You're, you're Jewish by descent. Your heritage is Jewish. Anybody here Jewish? Okay. Well, yes. Rose? I am 1.2%. <laughs> okay. How many, there you go. That is God's coming into the Lord. Okay, so that makes the rest of us, what do we call ourselves? Gentiles. Gentiles. And we're women. And that was two things that were like, at the time of Jesus, if you were a Gentile and you were a woman, you really were low on the totem pole of um, spiritual acceptance within a, a community that would worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, if you were a Gentile woman, you were low on that totem pole. So some of us don't know what we have because it's all we've ever known is access to the Father through Christ. But we're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews and we're going to find out that a lot went into this plan of salvation that we as Gentiles are a little ignorant about because we didn't inherit these customs and these beliefs that Jewish people inherited. In this book, this is the 19th book in the New Testament, and it's a letter written by an unknown Christian. We don't know who the author is. Is you know if you read Ephesians you know it's Paul if you read First Peter you know it's Peter if you read First John you know it's John um, First Timothy is written by Paul like we know a lot of these letters and who they were written by <clears throat> people attribute it to Paul <clears throat> but there are discrepancies in the style that it's written of whether it's really Paul that wrote it some people think he left his name off even though he wrote it because many of the Jews hated Paul for his conversion and his departure from Judaism. You know, they didn't like him. Remember that they would take like those packs and we're not gonna eat until we kill Paul. I mean, this is the kind of, you think you have problems. You know, like, when you know people are saying, I'm, not, I'm gonna starve myself until I kill this person, that's a lot of pressure. And these were people that were so mad that he was coming in and kind of taking away what they believed was their heritage, their culture, their pride, their familia. Everything they identified themselves with, they hated him. 
So some people think that he did write, and he even switched some of his style so that they couldn't purpose, purposely uh, cause say that it was Paul. So he could like, because he's talking to Jewish Christians about Jewish things. So we don't know that, but that's a theory. This is the things we're learning. Uh, this letter thoroughly covers Judaism. Judaism means the practice of the Jewish people and their religion. If you're Judaism, it's like mm -hmm. Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism. Judaism is the religious practice. So you can have a non-Jew who still practices Judaism. It's the religious belief of the Jewish people and the things handed down in the Old Testament. The King James Version has Paul's name in its title, but it was not in the original manuscript. It was put there by those who assembled the King James Version. So if you open your Bible, it's King James. It says right here, the letter of the Hebrews from Paul. It does say that right there, but that wasn't in the original manuscript. Somebody just added that because they all said, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, me too, me too, and they put that down there. Others think it could have been Silas or Barnabas, but it's very important for us as believers to... Um, to not be adamant or stubborn on the authorship if the Bible is not adamant and clear on the authorship. Whatever our Bible is not blatant in declaring, we too must take the same approach as God's word itself. Be careful about arguments about the scriptures when it's not clear. You can discuss, but you can't be adamant if the Bible is not clear. That means you think your opinion is higher than God's word itself. And sometimes out of reverence for the word of God, whenever we get to something difficult or hard to understand, we have to say, you know what? That's difficult and hard to understand. <laughs> and we don't wrestle with the scriptures, it says, to our own destruction. And we don't have to be right. God has to be true. <clears throat> and it's better for us to go, you know what? I'm wrong. My husband has an incredible knowledge of the scriptures. He really does. He, he doesn't always articulate in a way that you know that because he... he um, has a different way of expressing himself verbally. But if you talk, I talk to him, he'll come up, no way, da, 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 da. I'm like, what? And I'm like, you know what, you're totally right, John. It does say that, I'm wrong. And we want to make sure that we are not trying to be right, but that we know what is right. And so can I just remind you that God says he gives grace to the humble. And we are never going to come to know truth if we're arrogant whenever we're talking about the scriptures. And if you're in a situation where you're talking about the Bible or who wrote Hebrews and everybody's going on and on, it's Paul, no, it's all silent, it's all silent. You know, you can just go, oh, we don't know, do we? But it's kind of fun to talk about it. But if that's going to cause division in the body of Christ, then we know we have to be a people who say, no, I'm not going to, um, just, no, I'm not going to, this is okay. That's all right. And I'm not going to argue about it in the midst of everybody because I'm not going to contend for something God decided not to declare plainly. Have you ever had to tell your kids, I'm not going to explain that to you? I know some of you know my story a long time ago that the facts of life were being discussed in my home. And I, every time I just give them enough information to like, oh, I hope that's enough. So they don't ask me the next part. You know, like, oh, I'm nervous. And so one time it, it kept going in the living room. It kept going further and kept going further. The kids, I homeschooled, so these discussions would just occur. And I remember, I, they, and they were, well, what about then? What do you mean that you, what do you mean you did it? And then how did that? And they were asking for some pretty clear details. And so finally I said, okay. So then I, I explained the detail. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, you're in your brace, you're like, oh, we're gonna go gross. And one of my children, who I will not name, or they would be greatly embarrassed, they sat there, they're thinking about it, you know, they're putting things together. And they turned around and they said, wow, you must really love us. I said, yes. I go, you were willing to do that for <laughs> But there is a time where we don't say things because the kids aren't ready for them. So there must be a reason. There must be a reason why, that, all that to say, there must be a reason why the Holy Spirit didn't tell us who the author of Hebrews was. <laughs> but it's not really there. So, you know, you need to just let people know it isn't. I, I've heard Jay Vernon McGee say that he read his commentary on uh, Hebrews that he wrote while he was in uh, theology, in the school of theology. And he said, oh, I, I knew it was Paul. Because, you know, the younger you are, the more you know. <laughs> he goes, I've gotten older, I'm embarrassed. He said about that book that was published, my attitude, my arrogance. He goes, oh, you know, and it, well, how precious that we learned those things. The bottom line is, 
Whomever the human authors are of any of the books of the Bible, we really know that they are not the ones who initiated any of the content. Turn with me to 2 Peter 1.20, please. 2 Peter 1.20. I'm going to go right into reading. If I suggest when I give a scripture, just write it down on the notes. And then as I'm talking, you can go back and see what it is. Because you'll, I'll start talking, you'll forget where you're turning to, and then you'll ask your friend, where are Because that's what I do, so I'm assuming you do too. Second Peter 120 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21 of Second Peter 1. For prophecy never, never came by the will of man but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So whoever this was, they did it by the moving of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we really want to care about, is that the Holy Spirit moved upon people. It's interesting to know who wrote it, um, some of the books. Like I know one time here we did a study on the character, the person in the life of Peter. And we watched Peter's life. You know, he did a lot of interesting things when he was walking around with Jesus. He'd say the wrong thing or do, you know. And then we'd read in 1 Peter and 2 Peter the truths that he ended up espousing after the resurrection of Christ, after being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we go, oh, that's so neat because I'm like Peter over here in the Gospel of John, so maybe I'll be like Peter in 1 Peter in a few years. You know, it gave us great hope to see the change. So sometimes it's nice to know the author because God still uses personality. But the truths themselves are from the Holy Spirit, and we have to remember that. In 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16, says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now that word inspiration is a, it, it's a word that means, S-P-I-R means to breathe. Like, you know, if we, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inspire. Not it, well, expire, yeah, all your breath goes out and you're dead. Expire. Inspire, well, there's another one. Respiration, respiration. That means to breathe again and again. Breathe is again, inspire is to breathe. So inspire means to breathe in. It means to breathe in. And it's saying that the scripture is given by the breath of God into the words. Does that make you love your Bible even more? Yeah. Like, oh, it's the breath of God. It's the breath of God. That's why we love the word. Because we're going, wow, you breathe through these people. Your very breath, your life. You know, what, what makes you who you are, God? It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, why? Why do we want all this? Well, so that the man of God may be complete. That means not lacking anything. Every tool you need that you and I can get as moms, as wives, as workers, as people who need to know how to eat right or take care of our bodies or handle money or be able to deal with forgiveness, or make choices for what job to take, or how to order our day. Don't, don't you sometimes just look at life apart from the big old huge things. Sometimes just day-to-day -day life, it's like, I, I don't know how to do this. You know, have you ever sit in the kitchen and you're like, do I wash the dishes, or do I do the laundry, do I start with dinner, or do I just sit down and have a glass of juice? <laughs> you know, and then sometimes the Lord says, you know what, sit down and have a glass of juice. Because you're, you're in a bad mood, you get hydrated, and then clean your house. You know, we need the Lord because sometimes if we go by our own inclinations, we don't always choose wisely. That's right. And we don't really know what who's coming over in the afternoon. And you feel this urgency to clean, and the Lord knows, you know, your mother-in-law's coming at two, and you need to have a clean house before she gets there or whatever. You know, the Lord knows these things. And that's why it says that we would be complete. That God's word would give us instruction. That's why we approach the word of God like it's the breath that we need. And it says in verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for how many good works? Every good work. Yeah, all or every. Like, don't you want to know anything we need to do? We can get information from the word of God. I know Sunday morning, my husband taught, I think, a rather complex section of scripture. I was kind of praying for everybody because I go, oh, I hope they're not like walking out the other way. Because <laughs> it was kind of deep. It was kind of deep teaching. Ooh, I thought it was deep teaching. And, but I loved it because I, I felt like I couldn't totally grasp it. And sometimes when I don't totally grasp something that God says, I'm impressed with God. I just go, ooh, this is like big, isn't it? You know, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to look at this all week, you know? I'm going, what is this bondage of corruption? You know, it's like, that is such a phrase. What does that even mean? You know, like, I was like, I was writing up question marks all over my notes. And I was like, whoa. And then it was really neat because... You know, uh, yesterday a situation occurred and I was in pain over something and, and then I told my husband, I go, okay, 
He goes, oh, are you okay? I go, ah, I'm in a little pain, but you know what? It's just the bondage of corruption. Like, and, I, and for me, as soon as I knew that, like, a, a biblical phrase to put on top of something I was going through, I could accept it. Because I'm not resisting it. I know God called it what it was. And then I know, and it says that we are not subjected without hope. He went through this whole thing. There's always hope in something. You have a new body coming. Any unkey things you go through, God says that anything we go through, he puts hope with it. Something to look forward to and get out of it eventually. It's a deep truth that was, I told you, I thought he did a great job. He was beating himself up all afternoon. I'm like, how does it that? I go, I, mean, I don't know about everybody else, but I am really instructed in righteousness. I feel equipped. I go, I'm gonna tell you, John, I don't know about everybody else, but you know, the health things I'm facing, what I think I'm gonna end up going through, that truth is gonna carry me through, even to my last breath. You know, that when I'm suffering, I'm gonna be able to be there going, okay, and it's, I love the word bondage, like you can't get out of it, your body decays, things happen, like you wish you could do something about it, but you can't, but it's truth, and God says that it's there, and as long as I know that he warned me it was there, I'm okay, because it's not like I'm going to resist something that's true, and so it says for every good work, he gives us his word, the scriptures were given not by the will of man, but as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, as we see in this book, or any scripture, this is one of the reasons why God has given us Hebrews, for these reasons here in this verse, for doctrine, <coughs> for doctrine. Some of you are going, doctrine, that sounds so stupid. Yeah. Doctrine just means things that are true about all matters of life, God, sin, history, the future, etc. It's just things that are true. Doctrine, things that are true. Things that are true. Then scripture is given in the book of Hebrews, we're going to be studying it, is good for reproof. That's a word we don't use a lot, but it means finding out where we're wrong. It's like marking, you know, having an answer key and putting your, your paper next to it and marking this is wrong or you need to turn these words around or whatever. When we're in the word of God, sometimes he says, mm, mm, switch, the priorities are wrong, you know. So he'll tell us when we're wrong. Also, it says correction. The neat thing about correction is after he shows us what's wrong, he shows us what is right. He shows us how to do the problem, not just the wrong answer. God never does that. Oh, you're totally blue. You don't know how to love your husband. Well, how do I love my husband? I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you you don't love your husband. You know, but God's so good because anytime he shows us something wrong, he intends to teach us what is right. That's why we're not afraid of God's correction because he's a good father. He doesn't correct us unless he plans on changing us. He doesn't, I always say he's like a good dentist. You know, a dentist isn't going to show you where your teeth are all crooked unless he's going to try to, orthodontist, he'll give you braces to straighten them. No one's going to take an x-ray and find a broken leg unless they want to set it. <laughs> and when the mirror of the word, when the x-ray of the word comes in, it's to show us things because God wants to put it right. When he says, you don't, you don't know how to love. But don't feel beat up. Be excited, I just told you that because that means that's what we're going to work on now. And I love that because God is for us, ladies. He's not against us. He is the finisher of our faith. He's not there to just tell us what's wrong. Scripture is given to correct us as well. And then it says that Scripture is given to us for instruction in righteousness. That means that when we read the Word, we can be taught how to walk in and experience things that are right, the way things are supposed to be. This is right. This is the way a family is supposed to be. This is how I'm supposed to speak to my kids. This is what I'm supposed to watch on TV. This isn't good. This is how, what I'm supposed to enjoy. This is what I'm supposed to not be involved in. This is a waste of my time. Oh my gosh, that's valuable. I've been ignoring it. That's what God's word will do for us. Show us what's right, not just what we're used to. Have you ever found yourself in a pattern in your life and you're like, I don't like my life? Maybe you're not in rebellion or anything. You love the Lord, but you can tell things just aren't right. You're in a, a cycle. You need to get into the word of God and say, Lord, I believe this wants to instruct me in righteousness. Change my style. Change my priorities. Because I, I can tell this isn't the life that you wanted me to have. And God says, it isn't. And you stay in my word, and I will show you and instruct you in righteousness. It says here in this verse that will result in us being complete. The word complete also means mature. Whenever you read that in the New King James, when it says perfect or complete, it just means mature. It doesn't mean without fault or without lacking anything. It means thoroughly equipped to have the tools for every good work. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is written, remember like the book of Ephesians is written to the Christians who live in Ephesus. The book of Philippians is written to Christians in Philippi. The, the book of Hebrews is not written to a group of Christians in one city. It's written to Christians who had been raised as Jewish people and had come to know Christ as their Messiah. 
and it's it's um, these new Jewish believers experienced quite the road to reconciling everything they had been told about what God expected from them and the fact that they now had put their faith in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection as that which had the final authority for their cleansing and their new life. This was a radical change for them. They were religious. They went to temple. They inherited the scriptures, the Torah. They had Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were God's chosen people. And now they had put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And the Jews themselves were very opposed to any Jewish person becoming a Christian. They didn't care about the Gentiles. Whatever, you want to live with Jesus? We don't care. But when one of their own converted and put their faith in this human being, this crazy prophet, this insurrectionist, this one that the Romans executed, they, that they brought before the Sanhedrin and found him guilty of blasphemy, these Jewish people would put their faith in this crazy man? It wasn't easy for the Jewish people who had converted. Look at John chapter 9, verse 22. And when we understand the Jewish convert's mindset, we're going to appreciate the book of Hebrews even more. Some of us might have come out of certain um, religions or churches where when we converted and became born again, you know, our family wasn't real thrilled with us. <laughs> I, I, I had that happen. I had my mother cry. I, she couldn't believe that I would be one of these born again Christians. She couldn't believe I would marry someone that wasn't of our faith that we were raised in. She couldn't believe that I would get married in an old white front store where she had bought a television. <laughs> she wept because I wasn't in the church. I wasn't, you know, and I remember having to go through that, not wanting to offend my parents, but knowing that this was the way. John 9, 22 says, his parents, this man who was healed, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. Because the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Now let's turn to John 12, 42. And I'll explain this to you in a second. John 12, 42. John 12, 42 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they didn't confess him lest they should be put out of synagogue. Now you guys are going, well, what's the big deal? Well, is it the same thing as like leaving a church in your life? You know, somebody says, you can't come back here. You get a little miffed, you think we're weird, but you go to another church and you just go, oh well. <laughs> you just go to the next church. Painful, but you can go on with life. The meeting place, the synagogue, meant acceptance into the community among the Jewish people. You are not able to buy or sell amongst the Jewish people unless you were part of a local synagogue. So if you became a Christian and they said you're out of the synagogue and you owned a business, no one would come in and buy your goods. No Jewish people would. If you wanted to go buy something from a Jewish person, they'd say, no, you've been removed from the synagogue. You cannot shop here. So they, they, it would change the world upside down. They wouldn't be allowed to go to anybody's weddings. They wouldn't be allowed to go to any birthday parties. They would be considered dead. Dead. As if they never existed from their parents, from their grandparents, from their cousins, from their... I mean, it wasn't just you can't come to synagogue on uh, you know, this particular day on Saturday. It was, it was rejection from everything they had known as family, religion, support, when they gave their lives to Jesus Christ, when a Jewish person converted. And that's, you know, it's, it's similar to a Muslim today giving their life to Christ, except they didn't kill you back then. And Muslims get, you know, even get murdered if they convert to Christianity from their own family members as a noble act to Allah, is to kill that person for the name of Allah. They'll kill a brother, they'll kill a sister, to because she converted. So they didn't go even further. But the Jewish people would ostracize them, and they had no links with anybody anymore. By believing on the Lord Jesus, Jewish Christians might have found themselves shunned, confronted, and perhaps having a difficult time reconciling everything they had been taught with this newfound faith. Like when 
They most likely knew, the people that were getting this letter, knew what happened to Stephen. Look at Acts 6.10. Let's read what happened to this young Jewish convert. They knew this story, most likely. And they're the ones that he's writing this letter to, Acts 6.10. Acts 6.10. And they, Acts 6.10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he, Stephen, spoke. Verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Notice how the Jewish leaders put Moses on the same level as God. Judaism and the God of Judaism were both important to Jews. A lot of people are like this with their religion. Their church is their God alongside of God. Can I just let you know it shouldn't be? The church is the bride of Christ. And we don't exalt our denomination or where we go or our pastor or what teacher. We never put people or history or heritage or culture anywhere near the level of our devotion to the Lord. They all come under, they all come under. Verse 12. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes. They came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council, verse 13. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. You hear that? They're upset about the law, upset about the holy place. Verse 14, For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Do you hear that? I don't want custom to change. This is the way it's been. This is the way it's always going to be. And I don't care whether God says it or not. This is what we know is God. You know, some people have just gotten into a religious ritual, and it's the way they've related to God, and they're comfortable with it, but it isn't really what God wants. And people get mad at you if you shake that up in their lives. We can even get like that. I mean, do you remember getting first born again and, you, and then somebody confronted you on something that you didn't know was in the Bible and you got all insecure and then and you realize, I am believing wrong. And, so, and then you, you hate that feeling, but then you land on the rock. You know, you're a little disoriented at first, but you land on the rock, oh, well, at least I'm building my faith on truth and not just on my own imaginations or what my parents told me or I heard over here or this pastor said. I remember the first few times I ever heard like something like a, like a pastor that I respected taught me something that I thought the Bible said something else. And I remember being like, what? That man didn't teach me the right thing? And the Lord goes, no, he didn't. And why are you putting so much trust in him? And I go, you're right, you're right. He was a good teacher, but he's still a man, Maureen. And you need to not exalt people like that. And you need to feel a little shaken. Or oh, somebody you respected fell into sexual sin or something like this. And then you leave Christ. Well, if you leave Christ because man did something, your faith was being built on man and not in Christ. And it should feel that shaking, not for um, insecurity that leaves you helpless, but an insecurity that makes you rooted. And you realize you were rooting into something you shouldn't have been rooting in. In Acts 7.57, it says, Then, this is at the end of it, Then they cried out with a loud voice, they stopped their ears because he had said something they didn't like. And they ran at him with one accord. Verse 58. They cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. Now when they stoned people, they didn't pick up little stones. We're talking boulders. They would just throw those and it would crush the skull in and the ribs. It would pop the lungs, crush their legs, their chest the, right here, and hit their heart with bone. I mean, it wasn't like, ow, ow, ow. I mean, it was, you were executing someone with huge boulders. You know, that people were lifting up and throwing at the person. So Stephen was put to death by the Jewish leaders and people because he had his faith in Christ. These Hebrew Christians, do you think they wondered? When they get this letter that we're going to study, maybe I'm going to be killed by people that I know. Because if that happened to Stephen, it could happen to me. You don't hear the Gentile believers having their lives threatened. But the Jewish believers, I'm sure, were concerned. So when we're reading through the book of Hebrews, and this is a really long book, because they really needed a lot of encouragement, teaching, doctrine, and like, yes, yes, Jesus is the way. They needed a good letter. They needed something specific for them. Now, it doesn't mean it's just for Jewish believers. It's for us as well. God preserved it. All scripture is profitable for all of us. 
But if you understand the context in which it was written, you'll appreciate the truths a little more. Like, ah, oh, if I was a Jewish believer, I could see why this would mean even more to me. I believe it, it's good, but yeah, I'd hold on to that in desperation. They needed a letter explaining to them how all they had believed in before Christ reconciled with all they now believed in Christ. They weren't throwing away Judaism. They were fulfilling it in Christ. They needed to see there was a benefit of being a Jew. And the things that God had spoken to Moses were still valid. And they needed to see it wasn't like, oh yeah, just leave Judaism and, and follow Jesus and become a Gentile. That no, there was a fulfillment of everything that they had believed in. They probably said, well, is this the same God? Did he change his mind? Was this the Old Testament, the Old Covenant? He said, you know, this one's not working. I think, uh, hmm, I'll send Jesus. And he came up with a new one. You know, some people think God changed his mind between the Old and the New Testament. But it's not true. The Bible says that Jesus was, was uh, sacrificed before the foundation of the world. The Lamb was slain. God knew where he was going with the Messiah before he even gave the law. Was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of Jesus? What were they to do with everything they learned and practiced to honor God? What about the law? We're into the law. What about the sacrifices? What about the high priest? These are like big things in their lives. They believed on Jesus, but still most likely had so much of an unreconciled understanding of how the Messiah, Jesus, fit in with everything that they had known in their relationship with God. Hebrews was so necessary, since many of the letters were written to Gentiles and non-Jews. They needed this letter. When someone comes out of a belief system equated with the most clear understanding of God, and then finds out that most of what they had been taught pales in comparison, with pure revelation of God's plan, it can be devastating to someone. It can be disarming. It can be unsettling. Even if you're confident in whom you believe, there's still a reckoning sometimes that needs to be done. Like you put your faith, I remember that I came to know the Lord and I was in a denomination and I was in there for a while after I was born again. And I was really loyal to my denomination. And I would go to the head of the church and ask question after question after question. And I was going, well, what, what can I keep and what do I have to spit out? And what's rooted in truth and what's just tradition? And what's man and what's God? And would the real system please stand up? Like, but I knew I was saved. But I still like, what did I believe about communion? Did I believe it really changed in the body of of Jesus Christ? I don't want to just believe what Protestants believe because Protestants believe it. They could be just as wrong as this other group did. What does the Bible say? And I needed to know, I needed to know. And I remember being very disoriented because when you're born again and you get into a group of people and they know all these words and everything, and you're like, I don't even know what they're talking about. And I didn't even know what born again was. I remember the day after I got born again, I went up to, I was in my room and I, I just realized I was a sinner and I realized Christ died for my sin. And I asked him in my room, I just said, oh my gosh, I've sinned against you my whole life. I've been like having you over here, but I've been living my own life and asking you to bless it. And I've said, it. my boyfriend's an idol. I, I, anything he says, he says, jump, I say, how high? I'm treating my boyfriend the way I'm supposed to be treating you. I'm so sorry. Please be my Lord. Take over my life. And I, I changed. My eyes were open. I, I knew that Jesus was number one. I went to, to school the next day. I went to this girl that was in my Bible class. So I went to a private school. And I said, hey, this happened last night. And she had said, you're born again. And I said, that's what it feels like. <laughs> where did you get that? She says, it's in John chapter 3. It's in where? In John, the Gospel of John chapter 3. And I didn't know the term, but I had the experience. And I remember just going, when's born again? I never heard of that. Because I hadn't heard it. I remember I bought myself a little metallic sticker at the bookstore. It said, born again with a butterfly. So I was like, ooh, this is what I am. I stuck on my pinto. I knew I was born again. You know, because you're, like, you're kind of getting it, you know? And, and and so it, it did, I was totally saved, but I still had so much to figure out what's true and what's not. I knew Jesus was the way. I knew Jesus was the truth. I knew he was the life. But what did that mean in my day-to-day -day life and in my spiritual expression to him? That's what these Hebrew Christians were going through. This gracious letter respects and exalts everything God had done up to the time of Christ and explains how everything through the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. The plans of God that have been with him forever. 1 Peter 1.20 <clears throat> says, 1 Peter 1.20 says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. It's in 1 Peter 1.20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but 
he was manifest or shown, revealed in these last times for you. This is back, you know, right after Jesus was here. Verse 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, gave him glory. So why? Your faith and hope are in God. He was foreordained that Jesus would come, but this is the timing he was supposed to come. In Revelation 13, 8, it says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 13, 8. Slain, the Lamb of God, in, in God's mind, was slain from the foundation of the world. Before the law was given, before the temple was made, before the high priests were decided, God already knew there was going to be a sacrifice that was going to be his son. Jesus knew that he was going to come. This book uses the word covenant, or you know, a binding agreement, 19 times more than any other New Testament book. Because the word covenant meant a lot to the Jewish people. So some of the verbiage in this feels kind of Jewish. <laughs> because it's written to Hebrew Christians. And we're like, covenant, you know, but it's 19 times more than any other New Testament book. In Malachi 3.1, and I'm going to remind you, this is an introduction into the book of Hebrews, laying a foundation for us. Next week, we'll start with Hebrews 1. Malachi 3.1, this is a prophecy about Jesus coming in the Old Testament to the Jews. Malachi 3.1, behold, I send my messenger. Who would that be? Jesus, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly, I'm sorry, will suddenly come to the temple. No. Yes. Oh, you're right, right. The Lord is a mystery of the covenant. No, I'm wrong. I mean, I'm right, and I thought I was wrong, but I'm right. Suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Do you hear that phrase? Messenger of the covenant? This is another name for Jesus Christ. He's the word made flesh, the word covenant, messenger, the word, you know, made flesh, the messenger of the covenant, the word made flesh. I love that title of Jesus. I don't even use it. It's like such a deep thing. I'm like, oh, good morning, messenger of the covenant. You know, I'm so glad you came to give us the message of this covenant in human form. And it says, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This covenant that God made with his people would be explained in the messenger of the covenant, in Jesus Christ. He would explain the covenant. The word would become flesh and dwell among us so that no longer would it be something kind of a distance between us and religious rituals, but he would come to earth and we would handle and we would hear and we would understand and we'd see lived out the very things that were you know, spoken of in the scriptures. John 5.39 says, you search the scriptures, John 5, 39, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. He was talking to the Jewish people. You search the scriptures, the law, to know what am I supposed to do, what's right, what does God want from me? He goes, but really they're pointing you to me. If you really go back a little bit, you're going to see they're pointing to me. It is in the book of Hebrews that we discover how perfectly planned salvation has always been. That God did not change his mind. He fulfilled all he did before the coming of Christ in sending the messenger of the covenant. And we should appreciate Christ much more than we ever thought we could. When you're done with the book of Hebrews, you're going to go, whoa, whoa, God is so consistent. Whoa, there's no coincidences here. Like, I can't believe, I never even appreciated that part of Jesus because I was already Jewish. I didn't know he was even doing that on my behalf. I just know he's the way. I just know Jesus loves me, this I know. But this whole thing, there's so much behind what he fulfilled. I didn't even know that. Do you know us not knowing what he did doesn't change the fact that he did it for us? You know, when somebody would go and, and like your parents, as you've grown up, haven't you just been so thankful for so many things they've done? And when you were little, you just took things for granted. You didn't even know they were doing certain things behind the scenes. And you look back and go, wow, I can't believe that. I can't believe they did that for me. I thought a few times about my parents sending us all to private school and how much money that is with, you know, seven kids' tuition, you know? <laughs> and I mean, you know, they could have bought all kinds of fun things or whatever. My mom didn't have a car for years. They only had one car, you know? And I just go, gosh, that, that's a lot of money. And, I, you know, I, they used to send it with the kids. We'd, they'd send tuition with us. We'd bring the tuition. Maybe that's then. They, I was in, like, third grade. And I'm coming in with the tuition. But, you know, we did that. 
And, and I, I, now I look back and I go, wow, now even if I, I just handed the envelope and, hey, we're playing kickball, I wasn't like, oh, mom, thank you for paying my tuition. It was like, what did I drop with the office back? Drop it off at the office and go play. But my tuition was paid. And it didn't matter whether I appreciated it or not, it was done. And that's why when we go through the book of Hebrews, we're going to go, whoa, there's so much more to this salvation that I've received, to this Messiah that's my Savior, than I ever knew. And we're going to be impressed. We're going to walk away. The confidence you and I will have in the gospel after this study will make us bolder with proclaiming it to Jew and Gentile. And it'll really help you talk to anybody who's Jewish. You'll really be able to explain some things to them. Although many of us are a bit ignorant of the way the Jewish person understood the Lord, we will, by the end of this letter, have a better understanding of the mind of God and how all he has said and all he has done truly displays his heart plan and should bring us to a place of great security, seeing the continuity, the intentional plans, and shadows will take on light and dimension. You know, the Bible talks about the Old Testament being uh, like a shadow. And you know, a shadow has a shape, doesn't it? But you can't see the details. Like, you know, if I put a shadow of a human, oh, it's a human. If there's like this ponytail or a bun, you might say it's a girl. And I'd say, no, it's a man bun. It's a guy. <laughs> like, you can't have a child with a bun. But... It, once the light came on, you, you could see the details. You know, what ethnicity are they? What color hair do they have? What clothes are they wearing? What expressions on their face? So a lot of the things that were in the Old Testament says are shadowed, and in Christ they become clear. Like we're looking back, so obviously hindsight is 2020. We can see things more clearly. Old Testament directives are all pointing us to Christ. Even now, modern day Judaism doesn't have all that it had at the time that Hebrews was written. The time of the authorship, just to let you know, it was very, very early that this was written. Very early. And, it, and how do we know? Because it refers to sacrifices being offered. So the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem hadn't happened yet. Remember when Jesus was here, the temple was here, right? And there were sacrifices going on. Seventy years after Christ died, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Everything was, and the temple has never been rebuilt. So weird. I mean, just that alone is like crazy because he was the final sacrifice. How could we, it never have been rebuilt all these years? It wasn't. When it's the mainstay of Judaism is the temple and the sacrifices, why hasn't it ever been rebuilt the entire time? I get why now. It's a little tense over there. But I'm saying all these years. Why? Because God didn't allow it to be built. Because when Jesus said it's finished, it was finished. Hebrews 10 11. Hebrews 10, 11. Oh, look, we're opening up the book of Hebrews. Aren't we studying that book? <laughs> Hebrews 10, 11. <laughs> but remember, the Bible always explains the Bible. And we always want to make sure we're not just going into something without getting a good picture of it. Hebrews 10, 11. And also to let you know, today's study is much longer than any other study because we don't have homework. I'm doing the intro, so just to explain that. Hebrews 10, 11 says, And every priest stands, present tense, Ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So see, it's referring to the Hebrews saying, hey, right now, the priests that are in the temple, every day they're offering these sacrifices and they're not taking away your sins. That means that the, um, that means that the sacrifices were going on at that time. That means the temple was still standing. Okay, so we know it's before 70 AD. So, that's the background authorship, time, all that. Now, interesting facts and themes in the book of Hebrews. The word better, the word better, is listed 13 times in the book of Hebrews. Better. Better. Better things. Okay, now I'm going to kind of rattle these off, so you're not going to jot them down. Hebrews 1.4. Jesus is better than the angels. Hebrews 6.9. Better things that accompany salvation. Hebrews 7, 19. These are going to be in your homework too, just to let you know. You'll be able to look them up. Hebrews 7, 19, a better hope. Hebrews 7, 22, a better hope. Hebrews 8, 6, better promises. Hebrews 9, 23, better sacrifices. Hebrews 10, 34, a better and enduring possession. 
Hebrews 11, 16. A better home, which is heaven. Hebrews 11, 35. A better resurrection. Hebrews 11, 40. Something better provided for us by God. And Hebrews 12, 24. Jesus' blood that speaks better things. Because to the Jewish people, everything they had was like, you know, hey, we're the chosen people. We have the best. And they're being told there is something better than what you have. Now remember, better is the comparative of the word good. Right? You have good, better, best. best. Superlative is best. You can't have better unless something's good. If something's bad, we don't say something's better. We say that's bad, that's good. We only use better when we're comparing with good. So it means that the Jewish practices <laughs> were good. <coughs> they weren't wrong. They were good. They're from a good God. Our God is good and does good. Remember that from Psalm 119? I pray that all the time. I love that truth. So the things that God gave to Moses and gave to his people were good things. Never should we poo-poo anything in the Old Testament or say, I don't need to read my Old Testament. We've gotten so much here, studying King Hezekiah, 1 Chronicles, Psalm 19. Come on now, it's good. But all that good stuff compared to who Christ is and what he did, that's better. That's better. All the truths we learn, great. It's good, but it's better. You know, he even talks about a better home because what, the Jews would be like, promised land. And the Lord is going, that's good, but that happens better. You know, he, you know, yeah, you have the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of Jesus is better than that. That blood covers. Jesus' blood washes. You know, that Jesus is better. In Christ, it's better. We get an understanding of the plans and minds of God in Hebrews. Also, besides better all over the place, there's also all these things that are exhortations that start with two words. Let us. Let us. Let us. I'm going to tell you what those are. In Hebrews 4.1 says, let us fear. Um, I think 4.11 says, let us labor. Hebrews 4.16, let us come boldly to a throne of grace. Hebrews 6.1, let us go on. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast. Hebrews 10.24, let us consider one another. Hebrews 12.1, let us lay aside every weight and run with patience. Hebrews 12.28, let, let us have grace. Hebrews 12, excuse me, Hebrews 13.13, 13, let us go forth. Hebrews 13.15, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. The reason there would be so many let us do this, let us do this, let us do that is that because there were so many rituals, laws, sacrifices, rules, and traditions in Judaism, the Lord's going to show the Hebrew Christians that Christ fulfills all these duties. But a Jewish person would read that and say, well, then if Jesus did everything, I, I can just sit here in the New Covenant and be apathetic because Christ did it all. But he wants to make sure by the Holy Spirit that as Christ has done all these things, because Christ has done the things you can't do, let us do these things. This should propel you now with a new mindset, not to please God and be in favor with him, but because Christ is, God is pleased, and because you are in favor, let us do this, let us do this, let us do that. Because they could have been very confused about how to live their lives. Like, what do you mean I'm not going to temple? What do you mean we're not doing this? What do you mean we're not cleaning all the stuff out before Passover? What do you mean we're not doing this and that? What, you know, what do I do with all my time? I was so busy trying to keep every rule to be right with God, now I receive Christ, I'm just sitting here. But there's so many let us. And some of us, I remember, you know, me coming out of a works-oriented denomination. I got really confused. Like, well, I'm saved, what? By grace through faith, huh? Not of myself, huh? Then why, why should I do anything good? Why should I? I didn't understand because my whole life I was like, you do good, so God will love you. You do good, so you get into heaven. And by the way, you have to remember whether you did things bad. And you got to remember how many times you did everything bad because if you don't do the right number when you go in and meet with this person, you're not going to get forgiven because it's only the ones that you said. I mean, you're like eight years old trying to remember every sin you've ever committed in the last month because I only went in that place once a month. It's a big burden on an eight-year-old. You know, like, well, see, did I not share? Did I not pray? 
Did I, did I disrespect my mom? How many times? Two? No, was it 12? Uh, I don't remember. You know, that you, if that's the religious system you grew up with, and then you're telling somebody you don't have to do what's good to please God because none of us are good enough, then you can go, well, what do I do? And that's why in the book of Hebrews, we're going to have so many exhortations. Let us, let us, let us. And I'll tell you, once I knew I was saved by grace or faith, I had more excitement and joy in doing righteousness than I did before. Before, I was all entangled in righteousness. <laughs> I was like, I got move. I've got to do what's right. Now I'm free to live righteously. And I'm free to live for the Lord. These exhortations are throughout the book, reminding these believers that the finished work of Christ doesn't mean we don't have any works to do. The let us now is rooted in response to what Christ has done on our behalf. And we serve and do based on acceptance, not on being accepted. I hope and pray that we enjoy learning both of Christ and all that has been spoken before the word made flesh. Look at Matthew 5.17, closing verse for this morning. Matthew 5.17. And in this study, we're going to be looking a lot at the Old Testament. Because a lot of the things in the book of Hebrews are referring to things in the Old Testament. And you're going to see the marriage of the Old Testament and New Testament together. The old promises with the new promise. And you're going to go, man, did God have a plan or what? You're going to go, you are like so on it. He's like, you know, he is. He's just really on it. Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Lord, we thank you that you chose Jesus to come into a Jewish culture, in a Jewish body, in a Jewish family, in a Jewish nation, and that we have to respect that. And we have to know that as Gentile believers, we're a little ignorant of some of the depth of that choice. And we know, God, that there is much more to our salvation than any of us have perceived. Things that you accomplished that we only know or have scratched the surface of. And we thank you, Lord, that you want to reveal to us more and more of what it meant for you to be the Messiah, for you to come, for you to be crucified. Why? For you to have your, your clothes um, ripped. Why? For you to have that veil ripped in the temple. Why? For you to be born in the lineage that you were in, why? For you to be without sin and be called a lamb, why? We all know a little bit of this. We hear this at communion, but communion isn't really Passover. So we don't totally always say, some of us have been to Passover, so we went, whoa, we're blown away. But Lord, this book is a New Testament book that you've written to help us understand everything about what went into the Jewish Messiah so that we understand that when we put our faith in you, all that we've inherited, that we who were once not a people are now a people. That we've been grafted in, it says, to the nation of Israel in, in a spiritual way. And so, God, I pray that you prepare our hearts, help us to have a healthy respect for your truth. And I just ask and pray that these things that we learn will become part of our understanding of your plan. And as it becomes part of your, our understanding of your plan, our respect and our security would, would increase. May you be honored. May your plan be honored. May Jesus be exalted, and may we just walk away at the end of the study in June going, wow, you really did come to fulfill the law and the prophets. In Jesus' name, amen.